Anybody want to come with me? I do, Mac. I want to go with you. Anybody else? Where? Any bar downtown. Mac, 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 you can't. Can't, 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 can't get out of here. Anybody want to bet? same time that the Jack Nicholson character in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest was trying to get out of a psychiatric hospital, a group of eight people were doing just the opposite. They had nothing wrong with them, but they tried to get locked up. Between 1969 and 1972, a group of colleagues and I gained admission to psychiatric hospitals by simulating, by faking a single symptom, which was that we said that we heard voices, and the voices said, empty, dull, Thud. The psychologist David Rosenhan set up an experiment where eight people got themselves admitted at different times to 12 different psychiatric hospitals. He himself was one of the so-called pseudo-patients. The moment we were admitted to the hospital, we abandoned our symptom and we behaved the way we usually behave. The question was, would anyone detect that we were sane? The answer was, no. No one ever did. He put the field on the defensive in a way that I don't think any other single study ever did. It was seen as damaging the reputation and standing of psychiatrists. It had an enormous impact, partly because of the time in which it came out, which is a time when psychiatry felt under attack from within its own ranks by a group of dissident psychiatrists who actually, well, some of them called themselves anti-psychiatrists, who were very, very critical of the way in which patients were being treated within the standard asylum system as it existed at the time. Richard Bentall is Professor of Clinical Psychology at Bangor University in Wales. It was the 1960s, revolution was in the air, and psychiatry was no exception, with the Scottish psychiatrist R.D. Lang, one of the loudest voices questioning the very basis of the psychiatric model. In fact, it was after attending a lecture by Lang that Rosenhan was inspired to do the pseudo-patient experiment. I was a student at uh, Swarthmore at the time, studying psychology, and David became kind of my mentor. Today, Hanko Karma makes films, but in 1969, he was taking David Rosenhan's class in abnormal psychology at Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania. He was a wonderful, wonderful teacher, talking about very exciting things at the time. Did he talk about the fact that he was planning this study or, or where his interest lay? He admitted himself for the first time in the winter of 1969. That class, I believe, was in the spring of 1969, so he was fresh from being in that experience, immersed in that experience. So, yes, he did talk about it. What was the feeling going on at the time that there was the context for this study? Let me point you to a couple of books that informed David and were in the air at the time. Thomas Satz, The Myth of Mental Illness, he wrote that in 61. R.D. Lang, The Divided Self and the Politics of Experience, arguing that society itself is insane and that what we accept as abnormal behavior is just a normal reaction to an insane society. And also Irving Goffman Asylum, which talks about the institution taking over and perverting staff, certainly in mental hospital staff practice. These were our textbooks, and they were very much to the point of why he did what he did. When he did the study, he was at Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania, but when it was published in 1973 in the journal Science, he'd moved here to Stanford University, among the palm trees in sunny California, where today's students get around on skateboards and bicycles, as you can probably hear. Even though David Rosenhan still lives here in California, he can't talk to us himself because he had a stroke a few years ago. But he has delegated some of his closest friends and colleagues to speak to us, and he's allowed us access to his private papers from the time when he was a pseudo-patient himself. Admission note, 6 February 1969. The patient, David Lurie, is a 39-year-old married father of two. All eight pseudo-patients used false names, and 40 years on, the identity of seven of them remains a mystery. But we do know that David Lurie was David Rosenhan's pseudonym. Three to four months ago, he started hearing noises, then voices. Recently, he has been able to discern that the voices say, it's empty, nothing inside, it's hollow, it makes an empty noise. <laughs> 
it was agreed that the symptom would be such an uncommon symptom as to be unknown. Lee Ross is Professor of Social Psychology at Stanford University, and he's been a friend of David Rosenhan's since the early 1970s. You want to say you heard a voice, but then you have to say what the voice said. That would, of course, have a big impact. So the idea was to make it completely uninformative, to have it not actually resemble anything akin to a common presenting symptom. Impression? Schizophrenia. Schizoaffective type. Depressed. Recommendations? One, admit to Haverford State Hospital. Two, Stelazine. Did David ever talk to you about the preparations that they made before the study and how they planned it? All I ever heard from David was that there wasn't elaborate planning, that they were given relatively minimal instruction. They were told not to try and role-play mad people. They were told to present a single symptom and then act more or less normally from then on. So there's a box here of David's papers, and it says on the side, on, on being sane papers, which of course is the title of his study. And these are some of the original papers from the time, and in fact there are, there are journals here of patient X and patient Y, so they're preserving their anonymity there. It seems to me the pseudo-patients were mainly his students or people who were taking one of his advanced seminars, plus a certain number of friends. He was a clinical psychologist, and most of the people who took part in the study had some background in clinical psychology or at least health psychology. He acknowledges that, and that became one of the many bones of contention with critics. That really wasn't important. People weren't using their devious knowledge of mental health in order to cleverly feign psychopathological symptoms. Patient is quiet and cooperative, pleasant, and gets along well with other patients. These papers were actually left for safekeeping with David Rosenhan's good friend, Florence Keller, who's a clinical psychologist working in psychiatric inpatient wards today. His point was, of course, that context taints yeah. all behavior. Yeah. So if you were presumed to be a patient, no matter what you do, it looks pathological. So you really, you don't need to have a great deal of experience yeah. to nice. look crazy. All you need to do is have something that says patient. Patient spends a lot of time by himself, writing and note-taking. This was described as note-taking behavior and assumed to be a symptom of the pseudo-patient's illness. The nurses recorded meticulous observations, but they didn't have much interaction with the patients. Rosenhan estimated staff-patient contact time at just six and a half minutes a day. One of the most moving documents I found in the box left in Florence Keller's safekeeping was Rosenhan's account of his own first admission, part of the manuscript for a book he's never finished. Imagine a stranger who comes to your house to visit, a shy and perhaps an upset stranger. Your first efforts would naturally be devoted to his comfort. Now compare your behavior with what occurred in the hospital. After being admitted for the first time, I was brought upstairs to the ward by a nurse, and wishing me good luck, she departed. The attendant led me into the day room. Pointing to a chair, he said, You've missed dinner but we'll try to get you some food. Sit anywhere. And he left. I waited for more than an hour and a half. At about 6.15, another attendant brought a tray for me. Here's your dinner, he said, and walked off. I was uncomfortable, yet had no idea where the bathroom was. Nor did I know where I would sleep or where my belongings were. What does one do here, I asked myself. Is there a phone? Can I call my wife and children? When will I see the doctor? When will I get my clothing back? I noticed that the staff stayed in the nurse's station, or the cage. We could see them, and they could see us, but there was no contact. I finally asked a patient where the bathroom was, but it was not till 10.45 p.m., 15 minutes before we were all supposed to retire, that an attendant showed me where I was to sleep. Minimal attention was paid to my presence, as if I hardly existed.
There were two parts of it, the institution itself, and what about an institution made psychiatric treatment the way it was, and the experience of the psychiatric patient the way it was at the time. And then there was the question of diagnosis. And so what was your role in the study that you did? In the summer of 1969, I spent about six weeks in Harvard Teaching Hospital in Boston, not admitted as a pseudo patient. David did not want me to do that because I was a minor at that time. So he set up my going in there as a student participating in a study that was about patient-patient relationships. Whereas what I was really looking at was the things that he talks about in his study. How much time did the staff spend with the patients? What was their relationship with the patients? Just the, the institutional dynamics that became interpersonal dynamics in the treatment of uh, psychiatric patients. What happened to your observations? Did they well, influence the pseudo-patient study? I can't say that they influenced it. Certainly the things that I was finding, he and his pseudo-patients, confirmed that on a more precise basis. They actually measured time that was spent out. I didn't have a stopwatch on anyone. Actually, I, other than David, I was the first one who did anything. So my general observations, I think, were then sharpened into, all right, well, here's what we're going to study and how we're going to study it in terms of the institutional aspect of it, not in terms of the diagnosis. And how different was it for you not being undercover like the others were? Halfway through my experience, I called him up and I said, I'm really frustrated. I really need to go in as a patient because I'm really not able to spend as much time there and he said Hank I can get you in but I can't get you out Feb 11 1969 in interview the patient was friendly and cooperative his speech was relevant and coherent and appeared of extremely high intelligence there was no evidence of psychosis at time of interview diagnosis acute paranoid schizophrenia in partial remission. Seven out of the eight pseudo patients were diagnosed with schizophrenia and they ended up being kept in the various hospitals for between eight and 52 days. It was once Rosenharm was working here at Stanford University that the real controversy broke over the pseudo patient study. I knew him when those studies were in the literature and when they were being hotly debated and uh, when he was having various back and forths with uh, critics. And uh, I think he relished that. I don't think David minded being at the center of a lot of sturm und drang. Wouldn't you say, Clint? I think he enjoyed the show. Yeah, he had a very strong sense of humor and a very strong sense of irony. Do you think he guessed when he was planning the studies that they would be controversial and that he would get this reaction from people? There would be no point in doing the study if he didn't think he was going to get the result that he got. I, I think what was unexpected was that it was published in Science magazine rather than any of the psychology journals. I can't imagine he could have predicted that. But the fact that it got published in Science gave it an audience it would yes. never have had if it had just been in the journal of whatever psychology. Mm -hmm. So it created more of a storm than I think he possibly could have anticipated. According to the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual and all of the leading textbooks in psychiatry and psychology, schizophrenia is a multi-dimension syndrome, a disorder marked by a variety of symptoms. How then did we obtain such a diagnosis on the basis of a single, rather strange symptom? The main critic was Dr. Robert Spitzer, who felt the whole study was an affront to the work he was doing on psychiatry's Bible, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, or DSM. His criticism was, this is not fair, because psychiatrists are not trained and do not pay attention to the possibility that somebody could be malingering, which is, at the end of the day, what they were doing. People don't want to get into the hospital. The assumption is, if somebody comes and gives you a symptom, that they have that symptom. They don't posit very seriously the notion that they don't have that symptom. So that was the criticism of Spitzer. And he wasn't alone. In America and in the UK, the psychiatric profession united defensively against Rosenhan, whose results struck at the heart of their attempts to be seen as a branch of medicine. If they couldn't even make a diagnosis correctly, how could they be taken seriously as doctors? Yet for Rosenhan, diagnosis, good or bad, wasn't the crucial factor. Among his papers, I found a copy of this response to a professor of psychiatry in Chicago. 
The pseudo-patients were not told that this was a test of diagnostic practices. Indeed, I had no intention on the outset to test diagnostic practices, and am quite sorry now that diagnosis loomed so large in the paper that I wrote for science. The real purpose was to engage in a psychoanthropological study of psychiatric hospitals. With regard to whether pseudo-patients remained in the hospital longer in order to prove the injustice of hospital detainment, my quick response to you is to suggest you try it. The boredom, the mismatch between their needs and what the hospital provided, an unending litany of organization peculiarities about which you are yourself sensitive, those were sufficient to make nearly all of the pseudo-patients very anxious to leave. Now that it's all written in that science paper, it seems easy enough. But I'm not kidding, Ted. Try it yourself to see if your hypothesis holds. I'm uh, Richard Bentall. I'm Professor of Clinical Psychology at the University of Bangor. I think you could say that in some ways it wasn't a fair experiment, in fact because read naively, the main conclusion is that psychiatrists don't know who's mentally ill and who isn't. And, of course, it's not really surprising that you can fool a psychiatrist by pretending to have certain symptoms. I mean, any good actor should be able to do that. But that's maybe not much different than, for example, fooling your GP by complaining of a stomach pain when you haven't really got one. Of course, a GP could do further tests to find out whether you had a stomach problem or not and, and what that was related to. But if the study wasn't showing that diagnosis is inadequate, what was it showing? Well, I think the study revealed very clearly the way in which the behaviour of patients once they were admitted to hospital was taken out of context. Whatever the patients did was judged to be in some way evidence of their uh, mental illness even quite innocuous things. So I think there's one chap who was sitting outside a canteen waiting for it to open because uh, there was absolutely nothing else to do and he's accused of having an oral acquisitive syndrome. When a person walks in to see a therapist, that person is now seen through a patient lens and very ordinary behaviours are now going to seem extraordinary or pathological. Just a year after the publication of Being Sane in Insane Places, Ellen Langer, who's now Professor of Psychology at Harvard, published a study called A Patient by Any Other Name. We videotaped a conversation between somebody who was interviewing people for a new job and a job applicant. We showed this videotape then to people who were therapists, and we called the person on the videotape a patient, or we called them a job applicant. What we had expected and what we found was that when the person was called a patient, even though it was the exact same tape, the therapist examined his ordinary behavior and saw it as confirmation of his patient status. Labels tend to lead us on this mindless information search. So we think that because we're getting more information, we're closer to some truth rather than all we have is more information that's biased. Altogether, the pseudo-patients were prescribed 2,100 pills, but out of all those tablets, only two were actually swallowed by anyone. The rest they pocketed, or hid in their mouths, cheeking as they call it, before flushing them down the loo. For me, the best bit of Rosenhan's experiment came after the pseudo-patients had left hospital. A hospital challenged him to send them more pseudo-patients, convinced that they could spot them. Over the next few months, hospital staff reported 41 fake patients. In fact, Rosenhan had sent none. It was never clear to me, and David was always a little coy about this, whether, in fact, he ever intended to send anybody in, or was he his usual disorganized David self and it never happened? I and think said, we should give him the benefit of the doubt <laughs> and said, let's give him the test, but again, we won't play entirely fair. We won't make it a discrimination test. We'll create a problem where the only thing they can do is have a false positive. That's true. It's quite a mischievous thing to think of doing, isn't it? <laughs> Very. So no one was sent at all, but they soon said that they had 41 pseudo patients. <laughs> he must have been thrilled with that, that result. That must have been quite entertaining <laughs> to watch those coming through. But it's a very serious point. Therapists alerted to the fact that some of the people presenting themselves might not be mad saw many people who were mad and that 
give some weight to the criticism that the distinction is not so much a matter of diagnosis as it is taking things at face value. Nearly 40 years later, diagnosis is still a big topic within mental health. Some clinicians are moving towards simply describing and treating a patient's symptoms rather than giving them the label of a formal diagnosis. And the debate over whether anyone can spot madness in another person carries on. Five members of this group are considered to be normal. The other five have been officially diagnosed as mentally ill. But who is who? In the most recent follow-up of Rosenhan's work in 2008, a BBC Two Horizon programme, How Mad Are You?, set a panel of three experts the task of detecting who had been diagnosed with a mental health problem and who hadn't by watching them perform a series of tasks. Clinical psychologist Richard Bentall was one of the experts. You didn't get it right with all of them. No, I think this is going to bite me for many years to come. <laughs> but that was the point, in a way, to show that psychiatric diagnoses are not as exact as, say, diagnoses in oncology, and that the borderline between normal functioning and psychiatric disorder is way for thin. In fact, we should see it as a continuum, really. There is another aspect, actually, of the Rosenhan study, which I think has relevance today, which is just the poor quality of communication between psychiatric staff and patients. The pseudo-patients observed that psychiatric staff would often just simply ignore them. If asked a question, they would just walk on. And this was true of both doctors and nurses. Perhaps this might be slightly controversial, but I believe that that's not uncommon today on psychiatric wards. Psychiatric patients on both sides of the Atlantic have talked of similar experiences in institutions over the past half century. Rufus May is a clinical psychologist working in Bradford, but when he was 18, he was a psychiatric patient with a diagnosis of schizophrenia. Then he studied psychology, and inevitably, Rosenhan. I really like this term he uses, this exquisite ambivalence. He talks about staff seeing people both in a compassionate way, but also seeing them with fear because they see them as diagnoses. And I think that's still very clearly the case. I think there are lots of good people working in the system, but I'm just saying the role often confines people. I would go into staff meetings, do the rounds with them, but I would spend most of my time, all of my time on the floor with the patients. And this wasn't normal. They were used to professionals staying with the professionals. And in fact, the head of service who allowed me to come in at the end of my stay wrote David claiming that I was in league with the patients, whatever that meant. Is it inevitable that there's always going to be a kind of us and them and that there's, the staff are always going to be the ones with the power, aren't they, and the patients are always going to be the ones left feeling helpless? I think there are things you can do, like there's a scheme in some trusts, just a few across the country, that positively encourage people with mental health problems to work in services. So then you cross the them and us divide because you have people who were them, now us, and vice versa. But also we need to get into training because most nurses, even psychologists and psychiatrists, aren't really trained on understanding themselves, being comfortable with their own confusion and mind states. It seems in our society we're always trying to push away difficult thoughts and feelings. That creates this leper role that Goffman and Rosenham were talking about. But there'd be no way to demonstrate its existence today with an experiment such as Rosenhan's. It would never get past an ethics committee. The tradition of participant observer studies will go on forever. It's just that it will be journalists yeah, who do them, right. not psychologists. And mm. If a journalist says, I'm going to go in, pretend to be such and such, the First Amendment in the States would protect their absolute right to do that. Yeah. If a psychologist says, I'm going to do it in a systematic way, report it in an unbiased way, and submit it to peer review, we say that's unethical. That's <laughs> so true, isn't it? How does David look back on this study now? Would he see this as the most important study in his career? It's certainly the one that produced the most notoriety. I don't believe for a moment it was the one that was closest to his heart in terms of his interests. I think the work on the Holocaust right. was more important to him. And he was actually quite interested in the psychology of religion and religiosity. Here's a tidbit that you don't know. David completed rabbinical training and uh, was days away from becoming a rabbi. And his brother is a rabbi. <laughs>
It seems amazing now to have that chance as a second year student to take part in a study by you know someone who then becomes as famous as David Rosenhan. Did yeah. you have any sort of sense of that at the time? He and his colleagues were just young, excited, exciting kinds of guys. Let's think up something neat and do it. That was very much the in the zeitgeist of the time. What was he like? I mean, he sounds like he was quite a sort of live wire. He was a lot of fun. He loved a good party. He was very concerned about his students, very approachable. He was always and remains an extraordinarily generous person, certainly with money and uh, with time. How much has David's success been recognized within the field of psychology? When you've done probably one of the ten most famous studies in the history of the field, it's very hard to escape that. So there is a way in which having done one great really? study gets in the way of people appreciating the fullness of your reputation and I think it also gets in the way to some extent of your own productivity. You're always competing. It's to hard to follow it up. Did. Can you make that big a splash? David Rosenhan has suffered a number of setbacks in recent years. The deaths of his daughter and his wife and health problems of his own that are so serious that he now has to live in a care home. But the legacy of his work lives on. Although he criticized the pseudo-patient study, Robert Spitzer, the American psychiatrist and editor of the discipline's Bible, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, did make changes to the third edition in 1980. So perhaps we can infer that Rosenhan had an impact even on him. I think David's paper had to be one of the major pushes to the DSM. Three. Mm -hmm. The two was all based on Freudian kinds of yes. wishy-washy concepts. And the three was when we got the Chinese menu. You know, two from column A, three from column mm -hmm. B, which is not an entirely satisfactory meal. It never is. You're hungry right after. But it attempted, at least, to result in greater uniformity in diagnostics. So it's trying to put some rigor on it by saying exactly. you need to have these symptoms right. some, in some order to have this diagnosis. Right. You've started to have behavior-based diagnosis yeah. and what's been called evidence-based treatment. In terms of, of the working field of mental health, for me, that is the legacy. The tradition of research on what it's like to be an insider is a very, very important, very honorable tradition in science. This was very much a study in that tradition. And in some ways, it's a bit of a shame that the emphasis became on the work as a critique of psychiatric practice rather than a serious investigation of what the experience of a real patient in an institution looks like. However difficult it is to be well in a sick place, it's more difficult to be sick in a sick place. Yeah. It's unfortunate that so much of the emphasis became on being sane in an insane place instead of what's it like to be troubled in an insane place.